Hey all, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for listening to Fat Burning Man, where we talk about real food and real results. I'm coming at you today from a uh, thunderstorm, actually, in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire, where I grew up at my folks' place. And it's awesome. We have two cows out back. Uh, we've been foraging for wild blueberries, huckleberries, uh, blackberries, and raspberries. We've been eating, we just had a bunch of zucchini from the garden. They're getting huge this time of year, and it's just heaven. I, I'm loving this rainy weather after being in Arizona where it was 116 but exciting news we just uh I just sold my house sold cars and everything else and we just got a truck and an RV and we're gonna call it the fat burning van and just drive around the country for a while this is no joke like seriously happening right now and we are so happy we're gonna be going to uh the fat burning van goes to burning man at the end of august so uh there's much fun to be had we're gonna be recording video pretty much the whole time and audio as well so i'll keep you updated from the road now here's a fun fact of the day uh just two minutes jumping on the trampoline will triple your white blood cell production giving you an immense immuno boost so aerobic exercise is also the only one of the best ways to flush out your lymphatic system so get out there and jump uh, go for a quick sprint down the block get that old jump rope that's been festering in your basement for the past 20 years and get your heart pumping it's good for you and uh, most of us don't do enough of it so on to the show uh, with me this week is a really down-to-earth guy who takes wild food to a whole new level uh, some of you may have seen him on the cutting edge food documentary hungry for change his name is Daniel Vitalis, and he is a rewilding pioneer. And it's pretty cool being uh, back here in New Hampshire. We have a lot of uh, overlap in, in terms of like where we came from, Daniel and I. Uh, I'm actually going to Maine uh, later this week. And one of the things that he does is basically finds uh, foods that you can survive and thrive on, uh, even heal yourself with, that are just behind your house that grow like weeds. And uh, my mom is a holistic nurse practitioner and we grew up eating the weeds uh, something like dandelion greens is usually packs multiples of the nutrition of, uh, of spinach or broccoli or anything else you might find in the supermarket and they literally grow like weeds in your backyard so sometimes being healthy can be really really um, good for your budget too so we talk a lot about uh, how you can use these foods that are growing everywhere to improve your life we also talk a little bit about um, how you can use things like uh, elk antler or deer antler velvet to improve your um, vitality and other medicinal herbs. We talk about teas and tonics. It's a really cool show. I hope you guys enjoy it. Now, before we get to the show, I wanted to uh, just ask one quick request from you. Once again, don't have any advertising or sponsors or anything else like this on this show. I do it because I want to uh, help other people get healthy like I did and weed through all that misinformation that's out there um, that seems to be harder and harder to dodge these days and talk with real people who um, can get their message of truth out there, how we can all be healthy and, and vital and happy as well. So if there's anyone, just one person who you think might appreciate this show, then please just send them a quick note. Uh, drop the name Fat Burning Man or Abel James so that they can take a listen to it in their car, on their computer, on their iPod, I iPad, whatever, gizmo um, they might be listening to. Please just share it with a friend. Think of someone you love and care about who needs this message and please share it with them. All right, let's go hang out with Daniel. All right, folks, really excited to be here today with Daniel Vitalis. He's a wild nutritionist and you may have seen him in the widely acclaimed film Hungry for Change. He's the creator of findaspring.com, a resource for helping people find fresh, clean, wild water wherever they live, and the founder of surthrival.com, a brand pioneering a lifestyle of health and adventure, and one that I actually have in my cupboard right now and, and totally recommend. I'm stoked to be here with you, Daniel. We have a lot to talk about. How's it going? Uh, it's going really good, man. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Yeah. So let's just like jump right into it. I was... Uh, before every guest comes on my show, I kind of like see what they're up to, go to their blog, Facebook and whatever. I saw that an hour ago, you posted a gift from your mom, which was the book, The Naked Ape, <laughs> which is the same book that got me started on this whole thing like years ago before I was in college. I just found in an old bookstore, this kind of like ratty version of the, the Naked Ape. And I'm like, what is this thing? And uh, man, what a powerful book. And I thought it was so cool that you just uh, put that on there. Way yeah, out of this, time. This idea of looking at human beings zoologically, I think, is like one of the major missing components 
in the whole health approach right now. Right. We're starting to hit on it in the paleo world is starting to like kind of get it, yeah. but it's still not really sunk in, you know? So yeah, I think this idea of us all becoming our own anthropologists is really important <laughs> for human beings to kind of survive totally. the, you know, 2014 and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, what's the, what's the gap there? What is the reason that we kind of take the superior role over nature, over our, you know, animalistic instincts. What is that? Why is why is being, uh, you know, part of nature ourselves so dirty to us? Yeah. Okay. So I call that the intrinsic taboo, and and what I mean is the core taboo, the taboo of all taboos in our civilization is wildness. Yeah. So any expression of it is silenced really early on. You know, you learn by observing others and their policing of you and your own self policing, you learn, don't let your smells out. Don't let your right. roar out. Don't let your hair grow too long. Don't do anything that alludes to you being an animal. And it goes so far as that if you were to actually strip down and take your clothes off and walk outside right now, if you live downtown, you'll be arrested and you'll right. be charged with a sex crime, right? Yeah. Because your nakedness is too taboo for people to see unless it's regulated, taxed and, you know, has a, you know, an 18 or over label on it. Right. So, so we have this strange taboo against wildness. So here's the deal. We live in a civilization. Um, hunter gatherer peoples don't live in civilizations. There are no hunter gatherer civilizations. Civilization means city builders. Okay. We build cities. Now in order to build cities, this thing has to happen called agriculture. You've got to grow food. You can't eat wild food anymore. Now, we're the only species that does that. As soon as you do that, what, what that is, is that's a war against the natural way. Our natural way for 200,000 years is we hunt and we gather wild food, like yeah. all the other species. When we decided to grow our own food, what we do is we make a sort of natural artificial disaster. Sorry, an artificial natural disaster. There we got go. it. Okay. <laughs> we, we rip a hole in the earth. Yeah. We call that tilling, right? It sounds mm -hmm. nicer. We rip a hole in the earth that replicates something like a landslide, let's say. In nature, when you get a landslide, you know, the ground opens up and the forest is broken apart. And then these annual plants will grow in there like band-aids until the forest can fill back in. Yeah. We rip an artificial hole in the ground and then we fill it with annual plants and then, then we eat those. And then the next year we do it again. And then the next year we do it again. Of course, it leads usually to the downfall of civilizations. And anyway, another <laughs> side note. So, so we... Uh, so we're doing this thing. It sort of works against nature. Now, we've been doing that for six to 10,000 years. And most people think this was the best idea we ever came up with. Yeah. So when you read about it, it's like, oh, the Neolithic revolution, we learned farming that gave us the ability to sort of live how we live today. What we don't often hear is like our skeletons shrunk and our brains shrunk right. and we started developing all of these diseases and on and on and on and on. Okay. So why is there a disconnect between seeing ourselves uh, as a natural organism or seeing our, the, the disconnect you're talking about, it's sort of the difference between an angel and an ape, hmm. right? We think of ourselves like angels when yeah. in reality, we are kind of an ape. And the reason we do that is because our way of life is based on the belief that we are separate from nature. It's so difficult to maintain a civilization. Yeah. It's so difficult to work 40 hours a week. It's so unnatural to an organism that usually works 15 to 18 hours a week. Right. Right. With very low stress, lots of open sex, lots of drugs, actually, strangely, lots of music and dance and freedom to live how we live, basically like serfs. Mm -hmm. It's a tough sell. So yeah. how you sell it? Well, the first thing you do is you suppress any expression of wildness and you make people think wildness is dirty mm. and scary and barbaric. Right. And so that's why if you actually looked up the word wild in the dictionary, you get the first definition talking about a natural organism. And then you get 14 definitions, everything from disheveled to unruly <laughs> to hairy to scary to right. violent to barbarous, because we are impressed early on with this idea that wildness is something we need to avoid at all costs. Yeah. And it's it's a brutal thing because we bankrupt ourselves from our greatest power in a lot of ways, right? When you're, when you're in touch with that, that gut instinct comes from someplace that is much deeper than, you know, your forebrain or, uh, the, the same brain that's playing angry birds or whatever. This is coming from an entirely different yeah. place. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, that's exactly, you're right to the crux of it. Now that beautiful <laughs> puppy on the wall behind you yeah. is, is technically scientifically is a gray wolf. Yeah. But it's been it's the domesticated subspecies of the gray wolf. So right. that behind you is Canis lupus familiaris, and the wild wolf is Canis lupus. There's He's talking about really... a yellow lab for those of you who are listening. Oh, okay, <laughs> right. Thank you. So and and uh, of course, all dogs are the same species, and all dogs they are only one species. No matter how much variation we see in their shape and form, their morphology, but they're all wolves. 
So some studies have been done. The question's been raised, like, if you just take a wild wolf puppy and you bring it in your house and you raise it, will it become a dog? Yeah. Oh, I love is this. This is cool. Yeah. So what happens? That, that, that At first, it kind of works out, and then you can't finish the study because the wolf shreds your home. Right. It's wild instincts aren't, aren't can't be suppressed in one generation like that. Mm-hmm. The dog is our man's best friend because we've lived with dogs for 100,000 years. So there's been, they like us, we are the, the two first domesticated species. Yeah. All right. Now, that lab, you don't want that lab in touch with all its instincts. You probably want it in touch with some of its instincts. Sure. But, but at the end Stop of the day. Stop humping my leg. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, it, and there's certain things that are cute. Like, yeah. oh, look at he's barking at the moon. Oh, that's cute. Sure. But, but really, if you expresses his wildness, it won't work in your house. See, domestication means of the house. Mm-hmm. That's the Latin translation. The, the wolf is not of the house. It cannot be of the house. We, too, are domesticated. We're of the house. Civilization is very invested in you not expressing wildness or being in touch with your instincts because you'd leave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you'd leave, right? Right. So the reality becomes it's very interesting when you look at our civilization, you see that it – I used to think it was like a zoo for people. right? Oh, it's like a zoo. We all live it's here like a zoo. Off, and yeah. I was like, wait, it's not a zoo. It's a factory farm. Ah. <laughs> now, because a zoo is a place where you keep wild animals. Yeah. That's right. Right? Yeah, they're wild there. They're yeah. not, you don't keep domestic animals. You don't go and like, oh, look at the pigs at the zoo. That's, right. a, that's, a, that's a different thing. Yeah. So you keep wild animals there for observation, conservation, study, right. research. But the goal of the zoo is to set the zoo up as much like the wild as possible and to feed a diet as much like the wild one as possible right. and to try to create habitat that feels like the wild one so the animal will express its wildness. Yeah. Or at least the they figured than- that out now. They didn't used to think that way, right? And that's, yeah, that's exactly. what their big problem was. That's why all the yeah. you know, uh, zoos had trouble keeping animals because they were killing them all because they weren't feeding them their natural diets, which we can talk about in, so, in another part of so this. So good. You get it perfectly. Yeah. So so the zoo now is set up to be like the and, – and what we want is the wild behaviors to be expressed. Yeah. For the zoologist, the most exciting thing is when the animal in the zoo is acting like it acts in the wild. If it will mate in, the, in captivity, this is great, right. like yeah. behaving like well. But on the farm, you keep domesticated animals. And you don't care what you feed them because you're not invested in them living very long. Yeah. You only are invested in their work or their meat, their utility to you. And you don't care if their diet kills them long term because you're going to kill them at the peak of their utility for you. Mm-hmm. And you do things to suppress their wild behaviors. And you'll even cut off their body parts, right? Like clip ears or tails sure. off pigs or beaks off foreskins off little boys. Whatever you got to <laughs> do to try to control the organism, right? And shape yeah. it to your will. So that it's not a wild organism anymore. It's a domesticated artifact yeah. of an animal, if that makes sense. So why so is that bad? Is- why, why is domestication bad? Or, or well, what are the pros and cons? Just, let me finish this thought and just okay, say yeah, this, go place, for it. this place is a farm for humans. It's a, and, but it's not just a regular farm. It's a, it's a high-intensity feedlot farm. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, all, it's like a CAFO for people. Yeah, sure. But the product is human labor and taxation of that labor. So we don't obviously grow humans here for meat. We grow 7 billion people for their labor and the taxation that they'll provide to the sort of elite. But why is, why is domestication so bad? Well, one, domesticated animals are sicker than wild animals. Two, they're more disempowered mm-hmm. than wild animals. So the, the, the weird thing about, and dogs are such a good example, yeah. um, take Take a dog very close to the wolf state and set it free. It could become feral. It could potentially join a pack of feral dogs. It could live in nature. Yeah. Take a, a little shih tzu and set it out. <laughs> and, and, and it's probably going to be food by the end of the night. Right. Right? It no longer can care for itself. So it's gone so far out on the evolutionary limb that the limb's about to break. It's in the shallow end yeah. of the gene pool, right? Sure. So here's the thing. We, we're pushing ourselves there. Mm-hmm. Now, okay, so I have a little backup here. I presented this theory recently that you, we humans are a domestic subspecies of Homo sapien. Now, we never talk about it. Mm. We talk about it with dogs and cows and pigs, and there's names for these animals to differentiate them from the wild form. Right. But we, so we're still Homo sapien sapien. So I've presented this idea we're Homo sapien domestico fragilis. Yeah. And the term just says, you know, we're domestic and we're fragile. And we yeah. are fragile compared to, so your average hunter-gatherer has the muscle mass, mass of an Olympic athlete. Mm-hmm but they don't work out, right? Right. They eat a diet way higher in nutrients, but lower in calories than us. Yep. They expend way more calories in their day, but they work way less. They have way more freedom, 
right? They're far happier. They have less suicide. They don't have any of the degenerative diseases. Their teeth don't cavitate. <laughs> I mean, when you look at it, it's kind of like, wait a second, what am I getting? And you know what? It's funny. They always tell you about civilization. What's so great about it? The arts. Yeah. Yeah, but we have all the arts. Yeah, okay, I'll trade the arts for my teeth and a longer <laughs> life and a more robust body. Well, yeah, but what, you, what you were saying too, I mean, like saying that tribal cultures never had arts is not, I mean, that's not fair at all. Yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> so, you know, paleo world, I want this to really impress this upon people from that scene. Yeah. There's this thing, you know, my friend Chris Ryan calls it the Flintstoneization of mm -hmm. ancestral peoples. One thing people forget is because we talk a lot about, oh, the ancient hunter gatherers. It's right. like, hey, yo, guess what? There's a hundred uncontacted tribes still. Yeah. A hundred uncontacted tribes. They're, they, they're still out in the forest right now in three different continents. I love that. Living still. And there's a lot of contacted tribes who are still hunting and gathering. It's not over yet. Yeah. They're not gone. This life way isn't disappeared. There's still people living like that. And what people I think sometimes don't realize is the conquest is still happening. Yeah. We're still killing those people off, integrating them, pushing them off their lands. It might have ended in North America, right? but it's continuing right now. Manifest Destiny in South America, New Guinea, India. So this is still ongoing, but there still are hunter-gatherers. But here's the thing. With dogs, so there we have that beautiful, I love the, the dog on the, the, the wall there. It's perfect. <laughs> so we have the dog there, and then we have the wild wolf, but the wild wolf still exists in nature. So in other words, the wild progenitor is alive. Mm -hmm. Now, take the cow. This is an interesting thing. The last wild cow died in 1627. 1600s, yeah. And yeah, they looked like gone. bison. They were like, a, amazing, right? they were different. They were cool. Big, badass animals. <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't want to mess animals. with one of those. Yeah, you don't want to mess. And if you did, you were a pretty mighty hunter, right? And, yeah. and actually, that was one of our main food sources. So they, this is the animal painted on cave walls. So, okay, so that animal is now cut from its root. We are left... Imagine that we have cows now, yeah, but there's no root back to their ancestor. We've killed the ancestor, so all that's left are the domesticated, kind of weak, shrunken, <laughs> sort of pale in comparison Fat. cows. Yeah, right. Fat. Yeah, exactly. Oversized, sort of weird animal mutations that we've created that we eat, and there's no root back. Yeah, we're about to kill off the last hunter gatherers, essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. This probably be the last generation that there's wild humans left. If we are the domesticated subspecies, we're making a big error here because yeah. our, that is where the richest, um, the deepest part of our gene pool is. Yeah. Right? And so what we'll do is if we annihilate those people and, and literally, you know, it's pretty sad when you go, I've gone down into the Amazon, you know, and you're like, yeah. wow, these people are amazing and they're wearing Reebok t-shirts. Mm -hmm. Like what's happening, right? right? They want cell phones. Oh my God, we're in the Amazon. They want cell phone. Sure. Um, so that's, we're in that phase right now. And I think, you know, in addition to these people having a lot of health that we don't have and robusticity that we don't have, we are also about to, yeah, eradicate our wild predecessor. And I think that's just a crazy, crazy concept. Well, we've just lost so much knowledge and uh, there's this weird thing going on right now where we all kind of like have been raised to think that we're separate from nature, divorced from it better than it. Um, but at the same time, we're desperate for it, desperate mm -hmm. for it. You know, it, it's like we need it. If anyone, and I've done this before, but like if anyone's out there, like take a second, think about your happy place and I will bet you money. <laughs> I'll bet you bacon and chocolate that it has something to do with being outside. It has some yeah. aspect of nature in it. Pretty much everyone's happy place. That's what it is. And, and maybe you're feasting with family or friends or whatever, but usually there's some, some green, some outside, some wild involved. There's some adventure involved. There's something yeah. relaxing about being outside. There's, I mean, you go into any spa and there you hear like Tibetan bells and nature sounds. There's something yeah. to that. So what is it about nature that, that brings back that balance and the harmony that we're all desperate for today? Sure. Sure. Well, we're, we're talking about, um, 5% of human existence living as civilized people. And again, when we say that 5%, because we're saying we're a 200,000 year old species, but of course we have 6 million years of hominid evolution. Yeah. Living immersed in nature. Our bodies, our minds, our, our whole spirit is, is interlocked, intermeshed, perfectly designed around our wild habitat. Yeah. 10,000 years ago, some people started to live in cities. 
But you can imagine these cities back then, 10,000 years ago, were still much more integrated into nature than anything we see today. Mm -hmm. And most of the world still wasn't living like that. Most of the world were still hunter-gatherers. Yeah. Over the course of 10,000 years, the city-state has spread, 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 and taken over, taken over, taken over. And the hunter-gatherer populations have shrunk, 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 shrunk. So for some, in some parts of the world, living estranged from nature just started like this yeah. year. Right. And for some of us, it's been multiple generations. People here who have Native American ancestry, we're talking 400 years maximum, mm -hmm. right? but a lot of them less. A lot of the African people, uh, African descended people here in North America come from tribal hunter-gatherer peoples in Africa just 400 years ago, Yeah. right? So there's a big range, right? Some of us from European descent have been domesticated really a lot longer, Yeah. but most of us still, regardless, this just happened the other day in our evolutionary history, right? Yeah. right? So we just went from the the most information rich environment imaginable to such info like look at your background and my background right like come now compare that to a forest yeah. in a forest the depth the layers the amount of species diversification if we just took a snapshot of a forest right now it'd be like oh we could probably count out 40 species yeah right how about right now it's like just humans it's a monocrop of humans oh my right. god like just people <laughs> um it's very information poor it's very species poor so we're feeling progressively more isolated yeah and the movement the direction is towards you know we went from the tribe of let's say 150 people mm -hmm. down to the nuclear family group yep now we go from the nuclear family group down this is the age of the narcissistic individual right right so everything notice everything starts with i now Mm -hmm. iMax, iPod, yeah. iPhone, I, I, me, it's all about me. It's what I want whenever I want it. And I can, I can watch my own movie, listen to my own thing, do my own thing right next to you. And I'm in yeah. my own little pod, yeah. iPod. I'm in my own pod, isolated from everyone else, including even now my nuclear family. Yeah. We're breaking down to the individual level such that not only are we missing the species diversity, but now we're missing the, the real human interaction. Right. Right. So, so we're, we're feeling incredibly isolated. So going into nature, it's like, let's face it, nature, is, nature looks to the average American like a, a wall of green because we've not been taught to differentiate the species that are there. Yeah. We, we sometimes don't realize, oh, what this is, is a massive community of plants, animals, microbes, fungi, all working together, creating this communal thing we call the forest. Yeah. And we are one of the animals that lives there, mm -hmm. but we've stepped out. So what we're doing is, so you, you mentioned it before, it's like, we think we're estranged from nature, and when we want to go to the happy place, we dress like astronauts, <laughs> right? So, yeah. so if we go to the Appalachian Trail and we pull somebody off of it, and we took them and we put that person next to a picture of an astronaut, and on the other side we put a picture of a hunter-gatherer, does the person on the AT trail look more like the hunter-gatherer or the astronaut? Yeah. Big, big pack, shiny Gore-Tex outfit, huge sure. boots, you know poles to walk with, all this gear, all this equipment, like as if they've come from some other planet to experience Earth's nature, but it's sure. a habitat that's d dangerous to them. Yeah. Right? So we're at the point now where we've, we experience our own planet like we're alien to it. We discuss nature as an external thing, mm -hmm. not as a thing we're a part of. We, we don't even recognize the word outside is a civilized word because people right. who are not civilized don't live inside. There is no <laughs> yeah, There's inside. no such thing. have like teepee or a sure. wigwam at best, but you don't spend your days in there. Living inside is a civilized thing. So this is really new for us. Yeah. It's an experiment and that's what people don't realize. And here's the other thing about it. It's an experiment that's failed every other time. Right. So you've, you, you, it rises up in Sumeria, collapses, rises up in Egypt, collapses, rises up in Greece, collapses, Rome, collapses. It, it always collapses. Right. And so we're, we're the ones who our thing is, well, if we can beat the, the, the house here, nature, yeah. we can figure out a way, we can use all her resources, we can build ships and we can go colonize space. <laughs> like that's the, isn't that kind of like, because you ever ask like, what, why are we doing that? What's the point of this? <laughs> Where, what is it? Like, it's like, this place sucks. We need to go to other planets. Yeah. Other planets are going to be better or we need more people. <laughs> so we got to go to other planets or I'm always like, what is this trip about? Why yeah. are we, why do we got to get out of here? So there's this sense that we're not from here or right. we're alien and, and indigenous people are always some other people. They're not us. They're like other people. Sure. Yeah. Cause, cause we're different and we have angry birds, yeah. but let's, yeah. because you're here, I'd, there are so many things I'd love to chat about. One um, is we used to think that we're shackled by our genetics 
this is uh, it's it's been pretty recently that we've discovered that we're not, in fact. Uh, epigenetics is something that is really freaking cool. I've talked uh, about that with a few uh, MDs on the show, but I'd love to get your perspective on what that actually means. You know, we, we shared 98% of the genome with chimpanzees. Obviously, we're, we're fundamentally different, but um, it's a bit of a moving target, which is dictated by lifestyle, not by your mom and dad necessarily. Yeah. Let's chat about that. Right. Now, there are epigenetic. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's a little of both, right? I mean, yeah. of course, we do know we are obviously affected by our parents. Our lifestyle impacts two generations down. So we're, we are experiencing some of what's happened to our grandparents exactly. today. Yeah. But that said, yeah, what's exciting is what genes you have don't you don't have to run out and get a double mastectomy because you have the the gene for breast cancer, right? right. You don't have to. You affect this. But <laughs> what, what would give you that tells, idea? <laughs> yeah, I know. Thanks, Angela. So um, the, what this tells us is that everything you do is training your genome. Yeah. Every second of your day is training how you sleep, how you eat, who you talk to, what air you breathe, what water you drink. I mean, everything you do, you're getting more proficient at doing. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I think like, hey, it's good to look at the other side of this guy's like, are you trying to train yourself to live in a cubicle? Yeah. Are you training yourself? You know, like, what are you training for? So my thing is always like, okay, if this is a factory farm, let's make it more like a zoo. Yeah. Let's at least make habitat more like a zoo so that we can expose ourselves to things like what are natural to us because those things make us strong. Mm -hmm. What epigenetics is telling us is that one of the really neat things is that the plant genetics that we consume radically affect our gene expression. We don't see it so much yet, at least in the current research with animals. Mm -hmm. In other words, it doesn't seem yet to matter if you eat bison or cow as long as the animal was fed well. Yeah. But it does matter if you eat lettuce from the store or wild lettuce. Right. Turns out it matters, right? So here's what we see, that we are impacted by the microRNA, little, little DNA fragments, essentially, from the plants we eat. And this is really interesting to me because when you look at a hunter-gatherer, you see, okay, wow, those people eating like 100 to 200 different species a year. Right. And we look at us and we're like, whoa, we're maxing it out maybe at 30 species a year. <laughs> Corn, right? soy, so, wheat, so, sugar. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. potatoes, <laughs> right? Like narrowing. I mean, I think like the, the largest vegetable consumption in the United States is potato. It's like, is that even a right. vegetable? Yeah. And so, they count so, like French fries and potato yeah, chips Yeah, they count that. it as yeah. a vegetable serving. It's like... Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, so <laughs> So the amount of diversity that we're exposing our genome to has been shrinking. Mm -hmm. So it's exciting with this idea of rewilding is, is like exposing your genome to more diverse plant food sources. Right. Sort of like what we used to experience. Now, what most of us, I, you know, I like to forage. I foraged three different plant species today, actually, before we're getting awesome. on this. But, but that's not, I know that's not the lifestyle for everybody. But sure. what we can do is play with herbalism, right? Mm -hmm. So when we play with herbalism, herbs are wild plants essentially. Right. So when you start playing with herbalism, let's say you do a different, you play with a different herb every week for the next year. That's 52 new species whose RNA you've introduced into your system, affecting your epigenome, shutting off cancer genes, shutting off degenerative disease genes, and flicking on switches that make you more robust and yeah. more of a wild creature. Yeah. You, we could do that. So that's really exciting. So it validates a lot of what I'm talking about, sure. but it also tells us that it's not just the food, right? It's the environment, right? And that I think is really important. And I and I always use this analogy of a fish tank with people. I say if we want to set up an aquarium, which is an ecosystem, we need four inputs: we need earth, food, like mm -hmm. fish flakes. Mm -hmm. We need water, <laughs> yeah. right? So we earth, water. Mm -hmm. We need air. That's the bubbler thing that bubbles air into the water. Mm -hmm. And we need fire, so the light. That's the full spectrum lamp that you put up there. Sure. So earth, water, air, fire. That's our four inputs too. We need the same thing. We need quality food. We need to drink quality water. We need to breathe quality air. And we need quality light. In other words, sunlight. And I think it's important that we start to expand our understanding of nutrition from this narrow thing of just food yeah. to actually include all of those elements because water is a nutrient. Right. And air is a nutrient, and and the pl strangely the plasma energy, the electromagnetism of the sun is essentially it's a nutrient for us. And when we're missing any part of that, it doesn't you can see it with a fish tank? It becomes obvious. Let's say I'm using crappy water, yeah, and I'm using like some kind of low quality, low power output light, and I'm bubbling cigarette smoke into the tank, yeah, but I give them the highest end organic fish flakes. <laughs> 
how, how good is the tank going to do? It's so obvious. Yeah. The water is probably the most important thing. I mean, that becomes really obvious, mm -hmm. right? You're, you know, in us, we're 65% of us water. Maybe yeah. it matters what water we drink. Maybe we should be as thoughtful about our air as we are about our diet. And so a big part of the body of my work is looking at how to sort of set up a more full spectrum lifestyle because every one of those four elements affects our epigenetics, affects our right. gene expression. Absolutely. You know? So what what are the quick ways or, or a quick way of explaining how you can across those four things improve yourself? Maybe not going back to living in the woods. I think a, a lot of us kind of realize that that might not be possible for the next generation or whatever, but what can we do like right now to kind of yeah. trend in the right direction? Yeah, yeah. So trending in, so what we want to do is we want to get off the factory farm and into the zoo. Yeah. Right. We want a little more of a zoo habitat for ourselves, a little more stuff to climb on, play on, hang on food that looks more like awesome. our natural food did. Right. We replicate nature as best as we can. All right. So, you know, I, I don't love to get into diets as like from the perspective of what should my, what should my calorie sources be? Should it be fat or carb? I don't right, care right. about any of that. Yeah. I do like to say if we put a, you know, on one end, we want, um, and we want this imaginary, not really possible to get to hunter gatherer diet. Mm -hmm. And we have the sort of sad diet on this end. We always want to be trending in that direction, right? Yeah. But one thing that I think is really important that a lot of people with food consciousness have missed is it doesn't just matter. Let's say that you're going to eat a tomato. Is it, or tomato is good for me? It's like, depends what right. variety. What is a tomato? tomato? Yeah. Right. What tomato are you eating? There's like 10,000 varieties. There's mm -hmm. 5,000 varieties of potato. Some right. of them are really low glycemic and high in, in, in proanthocyanins, but yeah. a lot of people don't know that. Right. Some they, taste like you know, grapes and are bright purple. You know, they're cool. Yeah. I mean, when you get into these good, foods, they're, they're cool. Good. Compared to the russet, they're good for you. Yeah. They can be good. They can work in your diet. Right. So they like have nutrients like, in them and stuff, Yeah, like, <laughs> which shocking, is nice. Right? Like I like all my food to be white. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> such a fragilist thing. So, so we can, we can be moving toward the farmer's market where heirloom products are available. Mm -hmm. That's really important. So so that we're choosing varieties. Like a lot of people don't know that the original carrot, domestic carrot, was purple. Not so they think, oh, yeah. now they've got purple carrots. It's like, no, those are the original carrots. <laughs> yeah. And those orange ones are are new, mm -hmm. right? In new foods. We want to be getting away from new foods towards more heirloom foods. Great study showed uh if you do the apple a day experiment with people, yeah. does it really keep the doctor away? And what they found was that the people they were giving an apple a day to got sicker. And when they uncovered it, what they found was, oh, it was the yellow delicious apple they were giving them. Wow. But if you switched it to Granny Smith, they did get healthier. Really? So it matters what you eat, that? right? The Granny Smith is still much more tart like a wild apple is. Right. Right? And lower in sugar and high in fiber. And then when you get those yellow delicious, it's a sugar bomb. Yeah. Right? So it matters. So we can be tracing all our foods closer to their heirloom varieties. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. You don't have to necessarily grow it or forage it, but make relationships with your local food producers in your food shed yeah. and start to become discerning about what you choose. Um, I just launched a new Rewild Yourself magazine yesterday, and we give a, a comprehensive list of plants. Um, that you can varieties that you can choose or plants that you can choose in your supermarket that are closer to their wild ancestors. That's and that awesome. Can be really helpful. We'll, we'll have to link yeah. to that. Right, could you cover just like a few examples? Yeah. Well, there's certain plants like asparagus is a great example of yeah. a plant that's almost wild. Mm -hmm. It's almost the same thing. You could buy sea vegetables like kelp, and that's still a wild food. When you choose berries berries are still containing their seeds. Mm -hmm. They're low in sugar. They're not sweet, right? Like make a right. smoothie out of strawberries and taste it. You're like, oh, they're actually not very sweet. Yeah. But they, they haven't been bred into such mutants, right? Yeah. But when we choose something like a lot of people don't know that they've, they've only ever eaten one golden delicious apple. They've only sure. eaten one red delicious apple because they're all clones. They've only right. ever eaten one banana. They're all clones. Go the to Thailand and banana. eat a banana. You get a different banana every single time. The pits yeah. in them, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. There you go. So the natural banana has seeds in it, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you breed a food till it's sterile, it's like, oh, geez, is this a good direction for right. us to go? <laughs> Genetically, is it good for us to eat plants that are sterile? What does that mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I think we can move away from these big, sweet, fatty, mutant, radioactive fruits mm -hmm. and move towards things like berries, yeah. right? And, and of course, with animals, 
we want to be choosing foods that are more grass fed and we want to be getting away, of course, from the grain fed stuff. We can move for people who choose to eat any carbohydrate. I think wild rice becomes this incredible food because it's still gathered by native people. Yeah, it's so it grows wild. It's gluten free and there's thousands of years of history with it. So we yeah. can be moving towards things like that. It's um, with our vegetables, it's, it's got that? like real nuttiness, like big yeah, flavor to it. I love it. It's incredible food. I've harvested it here in Maine. Cool. And, um, yeah, with our vegetables, a, a good thing to become aware of is that a lot of what we think is variety isn't. Mm -hmm. So you could you could think you were buying a lot of variety and find out you're eating the same species every day. Right. Just like if you imagine if if today you ate a white person, tomorrow you ate a black person, the next day you <laughs> ate a, a Asian person, and you thought, oh, I get so much variety in my diet, but it's like you know what, you're just eating humans. Sure. So so here's how this works: broccoli, kale cauliflower, kohlrabi, uh, Brussels sprout, cabbage, collard green, all the same plant. Yeah. It's the same plant. It's mutations of the same plant. So mm -hmm. it's, so, so we need to get more variety. So that's really important. And, um, we can be choosing things that are a little bit more on the bitter side. Yeah. Right. Whenever a vegetable is more bitter, it contains more phytochemistry. That's medicinal for you. Um, and we can choose foods that are brighter in color. Mm -hmm. So those two things really help. But if you think about a pharmaceutical drug, you bite down on it, it's bitter. Yeah. Right. Because what they, they usually are derived from wild plants. The alkaloids in most pharmaceuticals come from plants mm -hmm. or synthesized versions of what's in plants. Right. When we bred these Mar these foods that are in our market, we bred all that bitterness out because it was like, oh, it doesn't taste good. Yeah. We bred it away and then we ended up with all this food with no medicine. Mm -hmm. So what it creates is a deficiency in medicine and then people become dependent on external medicines. It turns right. out you need medicine. You just really need it from food. Yeah. But you can't do the food as medicine thing when the foods have no medicine left. So what right. people do is they eat iceberg lettuce and take pills. <laughs> yeah. When, when real wild lettuce is actually an opiate substitute. Is that right? Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can that? turn to the back of a High Times magazine and you see all those marijuana substitutes. Right. That's wild lettuce. I did not know that. That's yeah, really and interesting. And it was prescribed in both both the United States and Britain huh. to get people off. You actually can extract a latex from it that you could smoke, and they would use that to get people off of opium. Wow. And it's still sold that way today. It grows in my yard. I mean, it's <laughs> everywhere. Um, but it's very bitter compared to yeah. the lettuces we grow. Um, wow. But it doesn't require human beings just like the chihuahua needs humans to feed it, right. our lettuces need us to constantly protect it, right? With either fencing or mm -hmm. pesticides or whatever. It can't grow. Because it's a on pathetic its own. animal. It's it's a it's pathetic too, being it, at this and it's, point. It's claws and teeth were that bitterness. Yeah. Because all these insects would would try to eat it, and the bitterness kept them from. We could eat a little of it, but we'd usually have to cook it first. Right. Now we have lettuces you can eat raw, but everything else can eat them raw. So everything else wants to eat them raw. So when we breed the medicine out, then it's hard to grow the plants because right. they have no defense mechanism either. So the whole bottom line of this is when we choose the more bitter, like when you choose an oak leaf or a red leaf lettuce and you go, wow, this is kind of bitter tasting mm -hmm. compared to uh, dandelion. Iceberg, <laughs> that's Lord. good. Yeah. yeah. And then if you see stuff like dandelion in the store, awesome. Mm -hmm. Garlic, things that are real pungent, ginger, things that are real yeah. spicy. Right. All those strong flavors are super crucial for us. Yeah. That's the good stuff. <laughs> and your palate completely changes when you go away from those bankrupt foods to the more like bitter, intense yeah. foods. Your palate adjusts in a really, really cool way. Like for me, when that happened, it's I don't like sweet stuff anymore, you know, or at yeah. least I don't like the old sweet stuff that most people are eating. Yeah. Right. Like drinking a yeah. soda is is ugh. <laughs> it's gross. Yeah, no, I mean, can you imagine? It's like maybe to clean the pavement or something. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes too, when you look at where the wealth is concentrated in the world, so let's let's take mm -hmm. some of the elite, wealthy, old world money in the world. Sure. You go look at what they eat. You go look at their restaurants they eat at. You look at the menu. It's wild game meat, mm -hmm. hand foraged foods, fiddleheads, maitake mushrooms, yeah. wild leeks, right? They're, they actually eat you know, wild fishes, wild game meats, and a lot of hand foraged foods or yeah. heirloom produce. That's right. what the wealthy people of the world eat. That keeps them 
you know, the wealthy people in the world are a, bit, a little more tuned into their genetic lineages than a lot of us have been. Sure. They're a little more tuned into how am I going to pass my stuff down the line, that kind of thing. They're thinking mm -hmm. a little more long term and they eat a lot better. They're not eating McDonald's. They're not, eat, this is not how they live. I'm talking yeah. about the ultra elite wealthy. Right. They're eating a diet, domesticated people eating a very close to wild diet. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something very telling about that. There is. And now we're seeing there in that, and it's, it's nice to see you go to a really good high end restaurant. You'll yep. see that throughout the season, they're bringing in foraged produce. So that's mm -hmm. another really interesting strategy for getting high quality food into your life is high quality food preparation places. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you don't just have to eat it. You can drink it too. And, uh, I can't remember where, where it came from. Maybe Sean Stevenson, who was on the show before talked about your morning drink. Uh, and, and how you're basically just like stacking the deck with everything. So let, <laughs> yeah. can you share that with, uh, with the people who are listening? Yeah, well, I mean, the, so for, for our uh, ancestors, they use tools like the matate or the, the mortar and pestle, mm -hmm. right? And we see that throughout cultures, there's this obsession. Every culture likes to create beverages. Yeah. You know how big the beverage market is? You know, I'm in the supplement industry, so I see, right. you know, the beverage industry is huge because humans love to drink drinks. Yeah. Not just water, but all kinds of drinks, right? So we make all kinds of stuff. So um, for me, the blender is my modern matate. Yeah. I love a high-powered blender like a Vitamix. Yeah, and every morning I make some kind of drink. So what I like to do is I'll brew up an herbal tea. Mm -hmm. So I'll have three, four, five different species of wild plants in this tea. And I've gotten good at playing with flavors, you know, so things are really nice. Yeah. I strain that off into the blender and then I blend in all kinds of different superfood ingredients. Cool. And I create drinks that have usually a purpose. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, this morning my drink was based on um, yellow dock, um, dandelion root, and burdock root. Now, these are liver um, and kidney cleansing herbs. Mm -hmm. And this springtime is a really great time for that. So what it's causing me to have diuresis and extra bile production. Now, if I stack fat into that drink, that causes my liver gallbladder to go, oh, we need bile. And yeah. the dandelion that I just drank makes me produce more and excrete more. So I dump more bile, which causes more detoxification of fat soluble stuff from the liver. So we can start to create, I call it elixir craft. We can create- Elixir um, craft, I love that. Yeah, we can create custom- What's the word for that um, in designer drugs? Mm -hmm. We can kind of create our own holistic designer, designer drugs. drugs. <laughs> yeah, for ourselves that are designed to do what we need. Because yeah. the ultimate thing, and and you know, most of us want things to be really simple when it comes to food and diet. We most people want just a set of dietary rules, right? Yeah. I'm sure you've experienced that. Most people want to kind of shut off upstairs, and it's like, well, just tell me if it's just I can't eat carbs or it's, I can't have eat ass after six or whatever mm -hmm. their rules are. Sure. And the reality is we're all coming from different places in the world, yeah. different yeah. backgrounds, different lineages, and we're all dealing with different health challenges and sure. we all have different health strengths. So it's helpful when you start to dial in how to do your thing specifically. That drink is something that I might need, but you might not. Right. So I love the blender is where my, it's like my apothecary. It's my personal pharmacology yeah. sort of laboratory. And I do the experiment in, in my body. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And so you're in Maine, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I grew up in New Hampshire. My parents still live there. Where? And when we go back, it's, it's one of really? the coolest What part of New Hampshire? Uh, Center Harbor. Do you know where that is? Okay. Like Meredith, Dover. Lake Winnipesaukee. Yeah, it's uh, middle middle of nowhere. But we go out behind, excuse me, behind the house, and it's so cool that they've gotten into this. But you know, since I went to college and kind of did my own thing, and now I live in Austin. But uh, whenever I go back, we go out and pick mushrooms, and we find like chaga and my dad yeah. found this beautiful lion's mane, and oh, yeah. we even found wild cranberries out by the old. Yeah, treehouse cool. and uh you know all sorts of berries you know huckleberries blueberries all over the place and it's it's so magical and something that i, I wish more people could experience because you know you walk out in the woods and you're like oh there's green stuff here and some trees or whatever but you, you walk out with the woods who some with someone like you who knows what they're doing and it's like this it's is all right. this is food this is medicine you know this will like cure your um well, even even looking at something like poison ivy, poison oak, the antidote is right next to it, grows right next yeah. to it. Yeah. Can you talk a little, we don't have much time time left, but can you just talk about kind of the, that experience of going out behind your house or in your backyard and finding food and medicine there? Yeah. So there's, there's food, you know, and foraging is something you can do. I mean, 
Look, I've lived all over the place. I travel a lot. I foraged Montreal. I foraged That's New York awesome. City. I foraged Los Angeles. Wow. You know, urban foraging is a blast. And so this is something, you know, it's not limited to people out in the countryside. Certainly, the more nature we have access to, the better. Right. But, you know, for me, it's this. It's like, once you get to know, now your brain is designed for this. I bet right now, Abel, if you pictured each of those plants that you talked about g gathering, you'll remember exactly the spot. You'll never forget where totally. you found them because your brain makes mental maps of food sources mm -hmm. and you can't forget foraging sites, right? They yeah. become so important to you. In fact, my friend um, teaches foraging um, professionally and that's his way of doing conservation. He's like, look, there's no point in protesting a, a, a Walmart from coming in, yeah. what you got to do is you got to take a person there to forage. And once they've gathered food there, they'll protect that spot forever. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the way you've got to have a resource there. The per people, it's just mental. Right. But what, for me, when I, once you meet a species, a similar thing happens. Once you know a species, it's pretty hard to forget. Once you've foraged something, your brain sort of scans the environment for that yeah. thing always, right? It becomes an ally. Because it's a species, which means it's a living organism, which means it's an entity. And if it's an entity, you can have a relationship with it. Yeah. It's a creature. Right. And you then go into a relationship together. So they become allies. So what happens is I walk out into the forest as a mediocre forager. I'm certainly not an expert, but I'm pretty good at it. And I walk out and I know a lot of these entities. Yeah. And so I have a sense of being supported by a community of species. Yeah. We're in this so together. I'm, I'm, yeah, we're in this together and they'll care for me if I ever need to. Now, right. the, the zombie apocalypse prepper mentality is very big right now. The survivalist mentality is really big. Too many zombie the movies, is, I think. <laughs> the what? Too many zombie movies. I Too think. many zombies. So the attitude is I'll store a whole bunch of stuff in my basement and right. I'll protect my Alamo, right? Yeah. Yeah. When it's like, yeah, okay, first, good luck. Second, let's see how long you live off of freeze-dried food, <laughs> right. right? You're going to be dead in a year. Like you cannot live like that, not yeah. for long. So the reality is, oh, there's my pup. The reality is when you go out into nature, suddenly now you can be supported by all these organisms freely available and you have a sense of, yeah, I belong here. Yeah. And the person next to you is like still doing the I'm from outer space estranged from this planet thing. Totally, totally. So we're just about out of time. But before we go, Daniel, why don't you tell folks uh, what you're working on and where they can find you? They can find me at danielvitalis.com. And what I've been working on is a free online magazine called Your Wild Yourself. And I just launched issue two. Um, it's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a writer. Yeah. I write um, serious articles. They're, this is not your average internet fluff, 300 words that under deliver. This is a serious yeah. tome, each edition. Wow. And they're totally free. So if you go to the website, you subscribe to that, you'll get that, the links to that for free. Um, and that's there, at danielvitalis.com, right? That's at danielvitalis.com. And you can find my find a spring website. You can find Sir Thrival, which is my supplement company carrying mostly wild foods and foods for epigenetics. Um, and yeah, of course I'm all over YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, awesome. Pinterest and all of that. Cool. Quickly before we go, uh, a lot of people always ask me about why I take uh, pine pollen sometimes or deer antler. Would you mind just riffing on that for, for a minute or two? The, the yeah, main uh, benefits, why you would take something like that? Yeah, we live in a world that might as well be raining estrogen on us, <laughs> right? Estrogen compound, estrogen mimicking compounds right. are in everything we're interacting with because plastic mimics estrogens. Um, so I was really excited to find out that pine pollen contains ident bioidentical testosterone. Mm -hmm. That was just a mind blower for me. It was like, there's a plant that grows all over the world that every spring rains down literally tons of <laughs> testosterone filled plant sperm on everything right. and we can fit and actually absorb that. So we created a product line around pine pollen and we have a wonderful book on the site about it detailing all the studies that have been done showing it's containing testosterone, cool. androstenedione, DHEA and a bunch of other androgens and phytosterols. So it's an anabolic androgenic wild food. Cool. That's really awesome. Elk, we work, deer, elk are a type of deer. So the deer yeah. antler industry, typically they're using pretty low quality deer antler material from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. We work with uh, all elk from the United States. So wild elk living on big free range ranches, but genetically wild animals yeah. living on their wild diet. They grow out that eight foot rack in three months. It falls three off at months. the end of the year. And then the next year they grow it again. Yeah. It grows two inches a day. Really? Right? And, Holy yeah, smokes. two inches a day. Yeah. And it's 
not a bone at first. At first, it's very live. It's living tissue. It's vascularized. It's yeah. enervated, and it's really rich in all this connective tissue because all the stuff needed to grow at two inches a day at the tips, you have to have all of this collagen, stem cells, and all of these growth right. factors available there. For oh, geez, five thousand years, the Chinese have been consuming deer antler products, and for a thousand years, the Russians have been into it. But during the Cold War, the Russians got really into it. They started researching how do we make super athletes to beat the Americans? Right. How do we make super soldiers? We I were saw Rocky on, Four. <laughs> yeah, you saw Rocky Four. So you remember, you know, that the only thing that wasn't real about that is the Americans really were focused on on uh, more computer kind of technology, and yeah. the Russians were focused more on biotech stuff. And so the Russians were looking at superfoods and, in particular, adaptogens. And they developed a method for creating a really bioavailable antler formula to make people more anabolic. And so that's the formula that we use, but we've upgraded it quite a bit um, with cleaner material than they knew how to use then. But basically, it is uh, dr liquid drops. You've seen it. It's yeah. brilliant pink in color. Right. It contains six types of collagen, 24 growth factors, basically does what human growth hormone does for people. Mm -hmm. um, and um, lots of blood building compounds. In fact, it's really good for anemia, anything like that. It builds blood, builds tissue, feeds connective tissue in. And that's really important because most of the people listening to this probably exercising, yeah. wearing joints down, but not feeding back in the collagen they need to keep those joints long term. So, you know, so anyway, again, I'll, another wild food, um, but one that, you know, most people aren't able to go out and grow their own or forage right. their own antlers. So we're yeah. able to make this extract <laughs> uh, for people and uh, it's called uh, Immortal Velvet. Yeah. And it's something that I've tried. I've tried the, the pine pollen as well. And I try pretty much uh, everything that looks like it won't hurt me that's out there. And I can say that you make really, really good stuff. And uh, and I'd recommend yeah. if yeah, anyone's interested in. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, we're just focused on really high quality from the ingredient perspective, yeah. um, everything being completely natural and based on whole food. We don't do any isolated right. substances. We package them as best as they can be packaged. And our focus is on perfection, but also safe. Yeah. So we don't do products that can throw you into these imbalances that can make you ill over time and um, because everything comes from whole food. Totally, which is great. And there are so, I mean, like talk about a minefield buying supplements. It's yeah. awesome to see that like <laughs> yeah. some people are doing it right. So I, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a blast and I would love to have hey, you on again soon. Uh, yeah, awesome to talk to you. Really great to meet you, Abel. Awesome, thank you.